Welcome to the Crypto Teacher. And guys, you know, I come back with that video just to make you think. And we have MasterCard admitting that they're working with the CBDC. We know the central banks want total control. Track everything. Know what, where, and how you buy it. And they are laying down the foundation as we speak. And we know Paxos is very, very important because they're going to be doing real-time settlement, which is so important to liquidity. Now, as Bitcoin hits 50000 what shows up? That's right, CNBC. So anytime CNBC shows up, guys, we know we're going to have a pullback. We know the Fed, if they don't announce it this month or next month, we know that they're going to start tapering before the end of the year. Why? Because we know that the central bank digital currency of China is going into effect this year. And it will be ready to go when the Olympics comes. And 2022 is so important because we know ISO regulation will be here globally. Not just in the United States, but globally. And we know the Fed is about to pull that rug on all of us. Crypto stocks. So guys, if you can endure the pain, it's definitely going to pay off. We know the New World Order has to build a fourth industrial revolution. We know all this is based on Freemasonry. If you build, they will come. But this time, it won't be the people. This time, it's going to be robots, drones, and algorithms. Because we know, when it comes to the New World Order, it's all planned out. Y'all have a wonderful day be potentially involved with central bank digital currencies. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, governments around the world, as you guys know, are exploring um, design, different design aspects of central bank digital currencies. So last year, we announced a virtual test platform for central banks to experiment many of these design choices, how the currency should be designed, how it should be distributed, what features, including programmability and other things, need to be uh, there and to be rolled out. So this platform is available for um, licensed entities as well as governments to uh, test and design the system. And, uh, and we are at the core of it. If you look at what MasterCard is about, MasterCard is about a multi-rail platform allowing um, businesses and consumers to move values. So we have a card network, that's the most visible one. We also power ACH account to account networks around the world. We really look at this in that way in, in the sense that um, uh, now governments can have another approach towards um, designing and deploying digital currency. It's obsolete. So I'll give you an example. Um, we have uh, a uh, Bahamas has sand dollar, as many of you know. Uh, they've deployed, and one of the very first cards that are available that is based on CBDC is a MasterCard. Um, that card makes that debit um, the CBDCs in the sand dollar CBDC accessible everywhere MasterCard is accepted. So it's really, if, if, uh, if a central bank uh, were to deploy a CBDC in a given market, the best way to bring utility to that is through our network. So that's what that first card, it's, uh, it's first in the world. Um, uh, it delivers the value, they gain the safety and security and uh, utility, payment utility that we have across our network is brought to CBDCs um, as well explanation of how you guys are getting into crypto. Yeah, thanks for having me and absolutely. So MasterCard is all about choice in providing choice to consumers and partners uh, as they um, find different ways to uh, get paid as well as pay. So MasterCard has this crypto card program um, that enables consumers to access their digital crypto holdings um, that's held at wallet providers. We've had this program for a while. Now, this um, partnership that we are talking about really is about letting the partners who power those crypto card programs to uh, pay their you know, settlement um, using a new mechanism. We'll unpack that a little bit later, but this is really about providing choice to the players so that they can stay crypto native. And Paxos has been a key part of enabling that. Thank you, Rob. There are some cryptocurrencies out there that have questions surrounding them uh, as to whether or not they're securities. Uh, XRP right now um, and its, its situation with the SEC and also USDT Tether, which is uh, under a lot of uh, scrutiny 
uh, as to whether or not its its commercial paper holdings uh, make it basically a, a form of security. Will customers be able to use those kind of currencies on the system that you're providing to MasterCard? Uh, I, I'll, I'll turn this question over to Raj, but I think that uh, from Paxos's perspective, Paxos is providing the infrastructure to enable this use case for uh, MasterCard. And uh, Paxos is a regulated trust company. We're building financial market infrastructure with the mission to enable the movement of any asset, anytime, in a trustworthy way. But we're doing this as the most regulated platform in the digital asset space. So we were the first firm in the space to receive a trust charter from the New York Department of Financial Services, which today is our primary regulator. And we've gone beyond that to receive a whole bunch of other different approvals and licenses that give us the highest level of oversight and also access to the existing financial system. In order to be able to do that and to be able to provide this trusted infrastructure and the financial market infrastructure that is being used by financial services firms, we have to uh, abide by uh, uh, very kind of strict rules as far as what assets we can support. And so we're always scrutinizing and evaluating these different assets and making sure that they fall within bounds of existing regulation. Uh, and so there is a limit to the assets that we can support as a platform. But I would say the what assets that MasterCard turns on probably is a or, or allows into settlement in their network uh, is uh, under even a slightly different uh, um, uh, kind of uh, is done within a different framework. So, so Raj, yeah. uh, will those, yeah, will those currencies be supported? What would your advice be to people who are looking to accumulate Bitcoin? Where you know, now that you, we heard from Robinhood, how much a portion of their trading activity is also in crypto? So, in a way, you can access it more easily than ever. But which one is most efficient for users? Do you think? Yeah, I stay away from kind of recommending any one individual platform kind of in the in these public settings. And what I just tell people is uh, the more important part is like the timeless investing principles still apply here. So things like dollar cost averaging, you know, holding a great asset for a long period of time, et cetera. And what I think really is the generational divide is that uh, the older generation looks at this as the highest risk thing possible. I have over 90% of my liquid net worth in Bitcoin. And to the Wall Streeters, that's nuts. But to the crypto world, it's the most conservative thing you can do. They literally call Bitcoin boomer coin, right? They, they, don't, they don't see it as risky at all. And I think that that generational divide is playing itself out in markets right now. Um, and, and so I tend to just think that Bitcoin, again, I, I can't reiterate enough. Uh, I think that we are going to see very, very fast price appreciation through the end of this year. In 2017, Bitcoin went from $10,000 to $20,000 in 18 days as a blow off top. It would not surprise me to see something crazy like that happen before the end of the year. Kristen, it, it almost seems like when we get more uh, sort of clarity on what regulators are thinking that it, the, the crypto starts trading higher. Maybe it's just a risk on trade. We see that, too. And the Fed certainly helps. Uh, but people would like to know what what the, if they're going to at least let it survive and then have ways of regulating it. I mean, that, that might be bullish for the space. Yeah, I think what we saw in the Senate, what played out in the Senate over the past couple of weeks is that there still is some uncertainty around how regulations are going to play out. But what we did discover is that crypto has a political superpower, and that is its community of users who in a moment's notice can activate and organize and weigh in with their policymakers. And I think the fact that, that there was a pay for in the package that relied on getting revenue from cryptocurrency at a very high level, that's a very, very good sign. Now, we still need to work on the details, but you know, being on the ground in Washington, I've never seen the crypto industry or the crypto community more organized. Um, and so at least from the US perspective, I think that we still have some work to do, but that we're gonna ultimately get a good outcome on the regulatory front. We're going to a different economy and we're gonna be learning more about that uh, as we go, but clearly we're, we're, we're learning that things can be done uh, from remote, remote locations. We're learning that technology can replace people even more than we thought. We're not going back to the same economy. We're going, we're recovering, but to a different economy. And it'll be one that is more 
leverage to technology. And I worry that that is going to make it even more difficult than it was for, for many workers. In Silicon Valley and my friends who work in technology know that what we did to the manufacturing workers, we are now going to do to the retail workers, the call center workers, the fast food workers, the truck drivers, and then even bookkeepers, accountants, uh, insurance, agents, lawyers, and on and on through the economy. So what happened to the manufacturing workers is a very clear sign. This effort, and China has big plans for this. They intend to seed um, their digital yuan into the global environment by giving it away to visitors at next winter's Olympics. When they arrive at the airport, they're going to get di yuan digital wallets. They're going to receive digital yuan. They're going to use it uh, throughout their visits to Beijing, and then they're going to take it back to their own countries. They see this as a huge advantage. Why? Because who controls the underlying protocols, who un controls the underlying standards of the future of money will control the future of money. The most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. The storyteller sets the vision, values, and agenda of an entire generation to come, Steve Jobs. And guys, you know I truly believe in this. When you look at the New World Order, they're the storytellers, and that's the reason why I wrote my New World Order book. But guys, now it's time to change the current generation. And I wrote three kids' books. You know, I love the Trinity because I understand the power that's in it. So I have three books. We have an opportunity to change the generation, to educate, not just me, but I want to show you that I take action on a daily basis. And I want you to take action on a daily basis. Whether it's your job, whether it's in your community, we have an opportunity right now to educate the masses. I posted this on my Twitter account. Please share, but this is a short clip of the three books. There's going to be a clothing line and action figure. Please get these books for your kids, nephews, cousins, friends. So therefore, we can start the re-education now. Because as we see the fourth industrial revolution, foundation is definitely here. Robots, algorithms, drones, taking humanity out the picture. We have to re-educate. But let's get into the video. Part 1. King Yahshua and Grandma Tim. Face the village. Part 2. King Yahshua and Grandma Tim. Save New York. Long COVID-33. Part 3. King Yahshua and Grandma Tim. Goes to China. It's mandatory to get Part 1, Part 2, and Part 3 of this series. It's time to re-educate Generation Z.